amid shots fired, the Bastille Day attack, the truck at full speed spreading carnage in its wake, its driver at the wheel. The many hundreds that survived along Nice's seafront panicked, scattering, screaming into side streets to hide anywhere. Finally, after so long, the French police blast the windscreen of the truck and the deranged driver is dead. Good evening from the seafront in Nice, where last night's harrowing attack took place. An eerie calm has set in here, where last night huge crowds mingled peacefully until the attack. An attack that left 84 people dead. 50 people are still critically ill tonight. Ten of those who died were children. Huge numbers of people are wounded. But the carousel that was the children's play place was a callous target. Everywhere around it last night, smashed buggies, teddies, dolls, tiny flip-flops, men and women clutching babies and children. In the middle of the road, a child's bicycle snapped in two. Tonight, eyewitnesses testify to what they saw. There was this lorry and it smashed into everyone. Everyone. He zigzagged. He zigzagged down the whole promenade. There were people, there were children on their own. We report the attacker, Mohamed Laja Bouil, father of three children, separated from his wife. The police had regarded him as a criminal, but no radical. We report tonight to live from the attacker's home in this block of rundown flats in the northern suburbs of Nice. Also tonight, Theresa May is in Scotland on a mission to prevent the breakup of the United Kingdom. But talk of Brexit has been overshadowed by the tragedy in Nice. And when a, when a vehicle becomes a weapon, what can security agencies really do to stop it? Within a few shocking, terrible minutes, a night of celebration here turned into a night of horror. Crowds who had been enjoying a night of Bastille Day festivities ran in panic as a 19-ton truck ploughed hundreds of metres along the Promenade des Anglais here on the seafront. At least 84 people died. The roads were strewn with their bodies. People leapt into the sea, crowded into buildings, hid under benches, terrified for their lives. France has declared three days of national mourning. The attack said the authorities bore all the hallmarks of Islamic militants. Our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, is here with us in Nice. Lindsay. John, the latest is 84 dead, as you said, and then 202 wounded. 25 of them are on life support, 52 critically injured. This is a truly terrible attack. What we know, Mohamed Boutlel, he seems to have been acted, acting alone, but they haven't concluded that yet. There is no claim of any responsibility from the Islamic State, but it's very noticeable that the Islamic State, on two occasions, has talked about using vehicles instead of bombs. So it's possible that he was inspired by them, although we cannot say that he was in any way connected to them. We don't know if he was part of a cell or if he was acting alone. What we do know is that this was a truly terrible attack. And my report contains distressing images, very distressing images, right from the start. At first, some thought it was fireworks, but the display had just finished. Suddenly, people realized this was gunfire and they were in danger. The white truck had been stopped by the police. They now surrounded it and exchanged fire with the driver who had just mown down hundreds of people. An officer shone his torch into the cab. The driver was dead. A few minutes earlier, someone on a balcony was filming as the lorry careered down the road. Suddenly a motorcyclist pulls alongside, under the cab, trying to stop the driver, but he falls off the bike. Two police step into the road. Two shots ring out. Whoever is filming ducks down. The motorcyclist is still there, chasing on foot, followed by police. But the lorry accelerates away. Yeah! 
People were fleeing along the Promenade des Anglais, terrified. Young people and children. Families were all out for the Bastille Day celebrations. There was this lorry and it smashed into everyone. Everyone. The truck grazed my daughter who lost her flip-flop and then it hit my sister-in-law and then afterwards he zigzagged. He zigzagged down the whole promenade. There were people, there were children on their own, there were bodies on the promenade. Parents were rushing, shielding the eyes of their terrified toddlers and babies. Bodies were lying everywhere, crushed by the wheels of the truck. The emergency services covered those for whom there was no hope and gave foil blankets to others trembling in shock and fear, comforting the children. How could they understand? This morning, the truck, bullet holes in the windscreen, was still on the road. The man believed to be the driver, Mohamed Lahouej Bouhlel, a Tunisian living legally in France, was dead, his desperate, miserable night's work done. Memorials are springing up near the seafront. What to do but bring flowers and pray and share the grief in this beleaguered nation. Vive la France! It's more like a plea than a joyous patriotic cry after a Bastille day of such violence and tragedy. What's so terrifying is that the killer didn't even have a bomb. He just used a truck and a gun. And two years ago, that's exactly what the Islamic State spokesman said. He said, if you don't have a bomb, use a knife, use a stone, or use a vehicle. And that's what's caused such grief and such chaos here in Nice. Alexandre Giraud was working in his parents' bar, the Balthazar, when suddenly hundreds of people started running in, desperate for shelter. We got some uh, uh, steel barrier in front of the, the coffee, the people was just uh, jumping over it. And also I had like also uh, a woman gave to one of my, uh, the people I was working. He just uh, gave us the baby. Yes. And tell us to save our baby. Save our baby, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save me on my own. The French president and prime minister visited the hospital in Nice, where dozens were being treated. Many are still in a critical condition. Hey, there are many children, young children, that have come to attend a show of fireworks with their families, to be happy, to share a good moment, to be dazzled, and that were instead hit, hit to death to fulfill the cruelty of an individual and maybe a group. Patriotism. It's one way to counter the ideology of terror, to assert the idea of La France. But others are just bewildered. Why me? Why here? Why us, the French, again and again? Lindsay Hilson. Well, now detailed reports are beginning to emerge as to how Mohamed Boutlel carried out his attack. It's believed he was parked on the Promenade des Anglais for more than nine hours before he attacked, arriving before the police closed off the road, telling them he was delivering ice cream. After the Bastille fireworks, at around 10.30 p.m., he started his engine near the Avenue de Belay, drove his 19-ton lorry at the crowds. They tried to run, but he swerved from side to side, apparently to hit as many people as he could. The massacre stretched for a mile along the seafront. He was only finally stopped when police opened fire on the vehicle close to the Palais de la Méditerranée and Rue de Congrès. In his wake, he'd left at least 84 people dead and more than 200 injured, 54 of them children. He fired at three policemen who confronted him before he himself was shot dead. A father and his baseball-loving son, a student from Moscow, a Swiss woman, a Moroccan mother. Reports are starting to emerge tonight, revealing the names and the identities of some of those who lost their lives last night. This is what we know so far. American father and part-time baseball coach Sean Copeland and his 11-year-old son Brody were in Nice celebrating a relative's birthday. A family member said losing them in such a tragic and unexpected way was unbearable. Russian student Victoria Savchenko was walking along the promenade with her friend when she was struck. She was just 21 years old. 
54-year-old Swiss national Linda Casanova worked as a tax inspector and was on holiday with her French husband. Her death was confirmed by her brother. Fatima Charahi, a Muslim woman of Moroccan descent, was named by L'Express newspaper. Her son said she practiced a real Islam that was not that of the terrorists. He told the paper his brother had tried to resuscitate her, but that she had died instantly. Among the French victims, Robert Marchand, a 60-year-old industrial supervisor and athletics coach from the rural town of Massigny. The town's mayor described him as a dedicated and passionate man. Joining me now are two people who witnessed last night's attack. Lucy Wagstaff was in a nearby bar. Marco Barsotti was on the beach. Um, Lucy, when did you become aware something was happening? What drew your attention? Well, I've been in the bar for about a minute, and then my friends came rushing in, and there was panic. Their, say, their faces said panic. They were shouting, there's a bomb outside, everyone hide in the bathroom. So we all clambered to the back of the bar. Um, we were all panicked, we didn't know what was going on. Everyone was shouting in French what was going on. So the bartenders closed the door, they said, sort of hide at the back. And then they said, after a bit, it's okay, it was a firecracker, it's okay, false alarm, false alarm. And then people started running, and people kept running. Um, so Did you run? No, we stayed in the bar. We thought maybe we'd stay at the back, maybe that mm. was safer. So everyone was running, and we decided maybe actually something is really going on here. Um, so after translating a bit, we realized that we'd heard that there was a lorry on the promenade. So we thought, well, okay... Let, let me pause you there, because I, I'd like to get Marco Barsotti to reach the point you've reached now. You were on the beach. Yes, we were. Uh, which, which is below the promenade, about five metres down? I guess about five metres. And, and just tell us when you first became aware that something was happening. At the end of the fireworks, we climbed, in fact, back to the promenade here where we are standing now. And after 30 seconds, maybe, we saw all the people beginning to run everywhere. And I saw the black, the white, sorry, truck speeding, which I didn't realize. Towards you? Uh, not really. I was a little, maybe five meters away, yeah. and uh, he was zigzagging, so he could have hit us, but he didn't, obviously. Mm. So we decided to go back to the beach and hide there. I expected a terrorist attack, given that we are in France and it was the 14th of July. You expected it? No, given, given the, all, all the, the confusion, I thought it must be. Mm, I see, as attack. soon as you saw it, you thought that's what it is. That, exactly. But I thought it was maybe somebody uh, using guns. Mm. That's why we went back to the beach. When I you say you went back to the beach, a lot of people were going back to the beach. They were jumping over the wall? Jumping, some, some Five jumped meters. over our, our And into head. the water? Um, somebody went on the, on the water too, but the, we, we stayed as close as possible to the, to the wall, wall so to you could be hidden. Possible, yeah. you know, bullets. So now, you, you, at this point, you could see the truck? Um, no, I was actually running through the old town. Right. So we decided to leave. With a flood of others. Yes. Yeah. And chaos, uh, sort of, it was getting more chaotic. Panic mm. was increasing. Rumors were flying around. Mm. No one knew what was happening. We were being told bombs. We were told guns. And everyone's just sh shouting terrorists. So did we just did you, like Marco, uh, think terrorism? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Immediately. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, eventually you found some sanctuary somewhere. Yes, I ran to where I live, and yeah. I was safe there. And you found sanctuary on the beach and then eventually started to go back to your... After eight or nine minutes, there was apparently calm. So we went back and then we saw maybe 10, maybe 20, I'm not sure, bodies laying on the ground. And so we realized it, it was very bad. Mm. And it took about 45 minutes to have news from TV. So we, for 45 minutes, we were in a shock. We saw that and there was no official news telling us... And how are you now? Yeah, but there is still a quite an eerie calm here, isn't there? I mean, I mean, this would normally be a wash with people, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah yes, yes. Yeah. There would be a lot of traffic also. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Marco, and uh, thank you very much indeed, Lucy. And uh, we'll be talking to other eyewitnesses later in the programme. Thank you both very warmly. Uh, the man suspected of carrying out the attack has been named as 31-year-old Mohamed Lawerge Boulel, a French Tunisian who lived in Nice. According to local media here, he was already known to police for delinquent behavior, but was not on any terror watch list. Security and intelligence services will now be trying to trace his background and any connections to Islamic organizations, starting with a search of his home. Borrego Brown is there. Pari.
John, not for the first time in the last 12 months, we find ourselves standing outside the home of a mass murderer in another European city. The block of flats behind me is where 31-year-old Mohamed Boulel lived. What the carnage that we saw last night, the murderous event that we saw last night, was a swan song in a life full of violence and petty theft. Just this year, he was convicted of, for six months for a road rage incident. Interestingly, there's so far no evidence, as you said, of concrete links to terror groups, and so far no group has claimed responsibility for this. The pattern we see here, we've seen it again and again in Paris and Brussels with the Abdus Salams, with the Al Bahrawis. Criminals first, not particularly religious men. Another case of lightning fast radicalization. A mile long drive into the heart of darkness. When the bullets stopped, police clambered into the cab of the driver. Who was he? Why did he do it? Inside, police found his ID, a bank card and a driver's license, with a name and an address. The name, Mohamed Lahwe Boulel. The address, Rue de Tourine, some 15 minutes from the city centre. He lived in a first floor apartment. His neighbours spoke about him today. He's a handsome man, going grey, in his 30s. I would say he was someone who was pleasing to women. We wouldn't have guessed anything about him at all. He was always alone. I always saw him alone, but he went back and forth often. I've been living here for four months and I am still getting settled and I often saw him during the day. But he was frightening. He didn't have a frightening face, but a frightening look. A look. A cousin of his wife told the Mail Online he was not religious, didn't pray or observe Ramadan. She went on to say that he would beat his wife. Was, quote, a nasty piece of work. A couple of miles across town, the police were looking into the whereabouts of friends and family. <laughs> not without facing down some hostility from neighbours. The French prosecutor is still giving more details, but this is what we know so far of Lachwe Boulel. He's 31 and divorced. He was born in Tunisia. He was a chauffeur and delivery driver. He had a criminal record with domestic violence and threatening behaviour. Four years ago, Mohamed Mera, another criminal, killed seven people in Toulouse and Montauban. Today we spoke to his brother. His take, the extremists in the big suburban housing projects cash in on a narrative of victimisation and racism. They want to defend Islam, that's for sure. In the projects, the Salafists have taken over. The police have lost their standing. These young men have pinned their future and their dreams on Islam. And I must say, Islamic State or Daesh and their supporters use the narrative of racism, racism that they're suffering from. There's something inherently futile about trying to profile the kind of person who does this. Security services have to, to establish patterns, find evidence. For the rest of us, though, we do it to try to make some sense out of the senselessness of it all. Well, I'm joined by a student who was just here for Bastille Day. He doesn't live here. Uh, he's of Moroccan background um, and he saw everything. His name is Imad Dafoui. Now, Imad, what did you see? Well, uh, in the very where, beginning... Where, where were you? That was the first thing. Where were you? We were in my friend's apartment. We were there just watching TV till we heard uh, the fireworks. So we, just, we decided to go and check it out. Uh, so we walked to uh, Promenade des Anglais, which is next to the beach. Okay. Uh, we were there watching the fireworks till, till uh, the show finished. Uh, so we started walking around, taking pictures and videos, uh, till we heard people screaming from the back. So we looked That's back. That's down here. Exactly, yeah. it was down here, next to Hotel Negresco. Right. Uh, so we were in the middle of the street and it was super crowded, there was lots of people and especially lots of tourists, lots Paris. of women, yeah, tourists, uh, tourists, and lots of uh, children, old people, so uh, we heard people screaming, we looked around, we saw everyone was running and pushing, pushing, uh, pushing each other, 
because it was super crowded. It was hard to run there. Uh, Did you see the guy in, in the truck? In the truck, no, I couldn't. I just but you saw, saw the truck? I saw the white truck coming toward us, me and my friend. So we got separated. Uh, I went running uh, toward uh, the beach side, mm. trying to take cover, uh, till I realized that there is a bench on the other side blocking me from passing by. Uh, and the truck was really close to me, so I jumped over. I jumped on a woman. She was screaming too. Uh, then I just closed my eyes and because it was really close to me. Did you think you were going to die? Of course. In the moment when I, when I closed my eyes, I was just waiting for it neither to crash with, me with this or, woman who was next to you uh, I don't know her actually but you jumped on her when, when uh, of course of yeah. course yeah. she was down below this is a jump of five meters isn't it yeah. exactly yeah it was yeah. a small jump just over a bench and how quickly did you realize that a large number of people had died well it took me five seconds to know that it was a bit difficult to see it was a shock for me and uh, I freezed in my place for around five or ten seconds thinking about it just figuring it out uh, so after I jumped over uh, over the the chair, um, I just closed my eyes and waited for the truck to pass by. Um, did it pass? It did pass, and right. it crashed the bench that I jumped over. It also crashed the lights which were next to me. So, so I you saw were exceptionally so close. Exactly. Yeah, I were. Uh, besides, uh, I saw the the electrical fire of the lights. They were really close to me. So. When the truck but at what point by. did it get stopped? Did, did, did you see it get stopped? Uh, no, actually I think it stopped 20 miles from me. Tw it, it was a bit far away from me. Right. Uh, but as soon as I opened my eyes I found the truck going, still going, crashing well, people and screaming. Uh, I went running in well, the streets of Nice. Imam, to telling, thank you very much for telling us You're what welcome. you saw. I'm sorry what you had to go through. Of course, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well, now joining us now is Anne Gudicelli, uh, security and terrorism expert from Paris. And Gudicelli, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, Manuel Valls, has just said that uh, one way or another, uh, this man, this attacker, was linked to radical Islamist circles. What would those circles be and what evidence do you think he's got? He, he didn't say exactly that this uh, guy uh, is uh, involved in a... In, a, in any radical uh, cell uh, based in France and so on. He, he said that the modus operandi is very close to uh, what uh, the organization uh, Islamic State is usually uh, calling for and using and practicing, practicing it uh, very often. So, I mean, on other side, other fronts. So, I mean, um, do you think? I've, yeah. And I'm sorry to interrupt, me. but I mean, do, you look at this all the time and you look at these incidents the whole time. And I'm wondering, is it possible to look at this man as an individual with a tremendous grievance, a broken family living in terrible conditions, uh, and possibly with some degree of mental illness? Uh, could it just be that? Yeah. Or do you believe that it must be linked in some way to uh, radical circles? Well, uh, we don't have enough uh, evidence for the moment, but what, on my, on my view, let's say that it could be a mix of it. That means that his personal situation has created a kind of ground availability to, uh, to find, uh, let's say, a reference to, uh, to act uh, and to give more importance to what he has done. So it's possibly a, a kind of um, a mix, but we have to be cautious because uh, usually the organization is, called, is claiming very quickly uh, at least 24 hours after uh, this action. We have seen that in Orlando or in, uh, in France, in Magnanville, when uh, some police people have been, uh, officers have been killed. Right. So uh, right. We, we have but, to but what keep is, cautious. What, what, but, mm -hmm. but, yeah, but Anne, uh, w w one of the things which is particularly interesting is that, of course, we had this huge football championship here in France, no incidents at all. Then you have Bastille Day, and some of the people here have already said on this program, when they heard the first bang, they thought, that's terrorism. They knew that they were good. They really had a sense that this was inevitable. Did you? Well, there is, I think the, 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 put, the authorities 
has come uh, very quickly to uh, identify this action as being a terrorist like uh, jihadi action uh, uh, because there is a kind of context, you know, it's a big pressure. The day before, um, the president said that he will lift the um, uh, state of emergency. So it's very politically charged, you see, and uh, also the medias uh, are, uh, I mean, uh, let's say, uh, they, they are in a position to to, to be very careful and to very quickly jump on uh, this kind of uh, uh, interpretation of uh, this action. So, uh, for on my side, I think we need to be more cautious, not to to give more importance right. to that network because it, it, that will help that network. I mean, the ISIS net network to claim something that she right. didn't and, and, uh, and, ask for. And, and Giddy Chelly, I'm sorry to have to cut you off there, but thank you very much indeed. That was extremely helpful. We'll have more from here in Nice later, but let's for now go back to Fatima in London. Fatima. Thank you, John. Well, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, has promised Britain will redouble its efforts to defeat what she called brutal terrorist murderers, warning that a similar attack in the UK was highly likely. Mrs May was speaking in Scotland where her talks on Brexit and independence issues with First Minister Nicola Sturgeon were overshadowed by the events in Nice. Here's our political correspondent, Michael Crick. Theresa May's trip to Scotland was meant to be symbolic, breaking off from more ministerial appointments to stress at the home of Scotland's First Minister the same commitment to the union she'd made on the steps of her own new home on Wednesday night. So, Theresa May in office for less than two days, soon finding out how quickly as a Prime Minister you can be deflected by unexpected and often tragic events. Before she came up to see Nicola Sturgeon, this was Mrs May's response to the Nice attacks. I'm shocked and saddened by the horrifying attack in Nice last night. I will speak to President Hollande today and make clear that the United Kingdom stands shoulder to shoulder with France today as we have done so often in the past. If as we fear this was a terrorist attack, then we must redouble our efforts to defeat these brutal murderers who want to destroy our way of life. Yet May said during the referendum contest that cooperation with European allies on security was the prime reason that she, like most Scots, backed Remain. And this trip to Edinburgh symbolises her biggest challenge, overseeing the UK's departure from one union whilst trying to preserve another. I've made an early trip to Scotland because Scotland is important to me. I wanted to ensure that the first visit I did was up here in Scotland. I've had an excellent meeting with Nicola Sturgeon uh, and I look forward to very constructive and positive discussions with her going forward. I've already said that I won't be triggering Article 50 until I think that we have a UK approach and objectives for the negotiations. I think it's important that we establish that before we trigger Article, trigger article 50. The Prime Minister and I have got big political disagreements, but I guess we're uh, women who perhaps approach doing business in a similar way. So uh, I think we can have a, a good working relationship notwithstanding those political differences. Uh, I was very pleased that Theresa May said that she was uh, absolutely willing to consider any options that the Scottish Government now bring forward uh, to secure Scotland's relationship with the European Union. The terrorism in Nice presents an early unwelcome challenge too for the new Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson. Clearly this represents a continuing threat, if this is a terrorist incident as it appears to be, this represents a continuing threat to us in the whole of, of Europe and we must uh, meet it together. Thank you. In Scotland and in France, events show Theresa May faces a range of problems, probably graver and greater than for any new Prime Minister since 1940.
Well, to discuss how Britain works with Europe to face those challenges and to look at the implications across the continent, I'm joined by the chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee, Dominic Grieve MP, the French journalist Nadej Elzine, who lost friends in the Battle Clan massacre in Paris last November, and Marwan Mohammed, who's just arrived in London from Paris. He's the executive director of the Collective Against Islamophobia in France. Marwan, if I can turn to you first, you've just arrived from France. Your reaction to the fact that once again France is emerged in tragedy? We are appalled because we, everyone here in France has a, a, a family member, a friend who lives in Nice. Some of them have lost relatives and friends and colleagues there. So everybody's in shock. And even in our organization, in the volunteers, we have a lot of volunteers. We have a branch in Nice. So we are in direct contact trying to find out who's where and how are they, how is, is everybody safe? So that's the first immediate reaction. Yeah. Then comes the, like, the actual professional reaction, which is to say, we know that every terrorist attack in the following days will have a backlash in terms of hate crime, in terms of discrimination, in terms of hate speech. And, and we'll, come, we we'll come on to that a yeah. little later. Nadej, this is really personal for you, isn't it? You've lost two friends already. What were your emotions today? Well, I'm sad. Uh, and I'm fed up as well. Um, yeah, sad and fed up. Yeah, so and, and watching that unfold yet again, what did you think? Uh, but uh, I, I felt like I was leaving uh, 13th of November again. Uh, so phone calls to my friends in Nice, uh, they were all safer. So I was uh, quite relieved about that. Yeah, giving phone call to you know your loved ones in France to make sure they're okay, and. Um, and listening to French radio all night, uh, just in case something else happened. And, and yeah, so an infinite sadness. So Dominic Grieve, obviously tonight our thoughts are going to be with the victims, but people are worried about security and they are worried that something like this could unfold here in the UK. Are you confident that we're prepared for this sort of attack, particularly when we're talking about an individual rather than a network? This is a terrible event and one's heart goes out to the French people and to all those who've been affected by it. In any state, you cannot have a 100% guarantee of safety. Everything I've seen suggests to me that the British intelligence services are doing their very best in trying to prevent such attacks and indeed have been successful over the past few years in preventing uh, some attacks taking place. But that, a guarantee of complete safety is impossible. And as this, this incident has demonstrated, it is possible for a single person getting into a lorry to create appalling carnage. So I fear that we're going to have to live with this threat until such time as the, over, the surrounding circumstances change and the values battle with which we as democracies are collectively engaged with this type of extremism uh, is successfully resolved, and I don't think it's something which is going to happen overnight. Marwan, is there something particular about France? We've seen this happen repeatedly. What's going wrong? That's a very uh, important question that we need to answer collectively with analytical uh, uh, views. What we know uh, is that there is a discourse on the side of Daesh and ISIS. At this stage, I'd like to remind that we have basically no clue if this uh, event is related to well, ISIS. Well, Manuel Valls has said that there is a suggestion that this attack, one way or the other, is linked yes, to a radical th group. that's the thing about Manuel Valls. He always knows all the causes and all the reasons once they occur, yet five minutes before he's not able to <coughs> predict it and prevent it. Now, the fact that, the, that, we, uh, that we have do not indicate at this stage that there is a relationship. It hasn't been announced by ISIS or Daesh. But what is going wrong? We are seeing these attacks repeatedly. OK, so there are several factors. I'd, uh, I'd like to, to, to just state them quickly. The first one is that Daesh and ISIS are specifically targeting France in a number of discourses. And for a reason, they need kind of a Manichaean view of the, of the world. They need a country where Muslims are going to be ostracized if they are to be able to recruit some of these youth and say, see how you are being treated in so France. So in what way is that happening in France? So the daily experience of what it is to be a Muslim man or a Muslim woman means that when you wear a headscarf, for example, you cannot access a job, you cannot access university. Some of them are discussing now whether they should ban the headscarf in the university, in the corporate world, in the street. So your daily experience of what it is to be a Muslim woman is directly affected 
affected by, uh, by this. As Muslim men also, the state of emergency has allowed police officers and police forces to directly target a number of Muslim families. I'll just give a figure. There has been 3,594 raids on homes, six of which only led to an investigation on suspected grounds of terrorism. This means that there has been more than 3,500 innocent families that have been but, traumatized. But Marwan, sorry to interrupt you. France is in a state of emergency. This has happened repeatedly. People are worried there has to be some sort of security response. Yes, I understand that. But you understand immediately in the way you worded it that they need to see a political response. They need to see a security response. This is why we are implementing basically a political notion of security which is far different from an objective definition of security. Security at its best is seamless, focused, specific, efficient. What we've been doing so far is giving visible signs of being tough on terrorism that doesn't change our objective reality. We are not any safer today than we used to be 15 years ago. Now, I just want to come to you. Marine Le Pen has said that this means we need to declare war against the scourge of Islamist fundamentalism. What do you think about that and do you worry about it? Well, I think uh, basically Marine Le Pen uh, is trying to use this kind of events happening in France to get elected. Uh, I think she has a completely wrong and biased view of what's happening in France. And no, um, So what, what is going on in France? Are we seeing divided communities? Yes. Yes. Of, I mean, uh, I have lots of friends who actually uh, left France to come here, to live in the UK. They are especially of a uh, foreign background, because they know that uh, they, want, they will be able to get a job and not to be ostracized as they are when they are in France. There's a real problem of, uh, of racism in France. I mean, you can't deny that. OK. Dominic Grief, do you think the situation is somehow better here in Britain? Are we less divided? I don't think I'm qualified to comment on uh, the problems that France has in terms of integrating uh, minorities. I think this country has actually been very successful in its integration uh, and I think by European standards most people looking at the United Kingdom see very cohesive communities and growing interaction. There, uh, but so, that doesn't sorry mean to, interrupt to say you. that there aren't sorry problems. To interrupt you. There, there are tensions, though. People say that the government's prevent program alienates communities. So there are tensions here, too. Oh, I, I'm well aware that there are tensions. And, of course, violence, uh, terrorist violence, fuels Islamophobia. So it becomes a vicious circle. I have no doubt about that. And I, I'm currently working as chairman of a commission on the party, Muslim participation in public life. And it's been represented to us very frequently in the course of our evidence-taking sessions. Uh, that people feel uh, marginalised because of the security situation within the Muslim community. And so that does create problems. But all I'm saying is that although we do face major challenges in the United Kingdom, and I wouldn't wish to underestimate them at all, I think we have been actually quite fortunate in the way in which we've been able to manage uh, our process. And in many cases, I think the integration and the cohesion is rather better than some people realise. Dominic Grieve, thank you very much. Thanks also to Marwan and Nadej. Well, I look at some other news now. And the newly appointed Brexit Secretary, David Davis, says the UK could trigger the process to leave the EU by the end of the year. Writing in a newspaper, Mr Davis said the government could invoke the Article 50 process before or by the start of next year. He also said that the government would, seek, would strike trade deals with non-EU countries, including China and the US, and would aim to complete negotiations within 12 to 24 months. The funeral of the Batley and Spen MP Joe Cox has taken place. Mrs Cox, the mother of two young children, was stabbed and shot outside a library in her own constituency on June 16th. Her funeral cortege slowed to allow the public to pay tribute as it made its way through Heckmanville and Batley before travelling onwards to a private service for close friends and family. And then there were two. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump has revealed his running mate for November's U.S. election, along with a new campaign logo. The tycoon announced on Twitter that he'd chosen Indiana Governor Mike Pence for the ticket. Mr. Pence, who's popular among conservatives, is considered a safe pair of hands who can rally Republican loyalists. But Democrats described him as incredibly divisive and unpopular. Let's go live now to our Washington correspondent, Kylie Morris. Kylie. 
Well, Fatima, yes, Mike Pence, Indiana governor, but he had been in this place for a long time before that. He was a con congressman for the Republicans for 10 years. He's a very well-known figure. He's not a particularly divisive figure as far as the Republicans are concerned. Indeed, that's probably why Donald Trump chose him. Um, previously, he had uh, been very outspoken in his kind of anti-abortion stance. He's much more of a kind of traditional conservative of the kind that Donald Trump is definitely not. Now, interestingly, though, responding to the Nice attacks today, he issued a tweet because the Republicans now seem to certainly run their campaign on Twitter. Uh, he said, today's terror attack in France, a horrific reminder of the threat facing Western civilization. This must end. Now, previously, Mike Pence had actually uh, kind of fought against, opposed Donald Trump's suggestion of a ban on Muslims, but obviously today falling into line, at least in the rhetoric, and we'll be hearing more of that come the Republican convention in Cleveland next week. So, Kylie, there's been an unexpected release of information from Congress in the past hour. Detail from its inquiry into 9-11. What have we actually learnt? That's right. These are the highly sought after 28 pages which have been buried for some years now. Uh, it it's goes to the very heart of the extent to which the 9-11 hijackers may have been assisted by the Saudi government. Now, there were later inquiries which ruled out any direct links, but for years, campaigners, particularly the families of those killed on 9-11, had asked for this information to be released. Uh, the pages discuss those links, and certainly they consider specifically uh, people who may have worked for the Saudi intelligence agency, but the links aren't confirmed. The Saudis have welcomed the release. The White House says they show no evidence of Saudi complicity. Thanks very much, Kayleigh. After the break, how safe are our public spaces and our way of life? We'll be looking at Britain's security and at the wider impact on France, now reeling from yet another dreadful attack, and on Europe, united in grief. Well, you join us with the normal traffic of aircraft going across, but below, right here on the seafront in Nice, a vigil being held in memory of the 84 who've died in this horrific attack and of the 54 still struggling for their lives and the many other wounded who are still in hospital. But our police across Britain are reviewing security around large public events next week, as Theresa May described it as prudent, cautious and the right thing to do. Britain is one of the countries that's led the way on protecting public spaces with measures like bollards and blast barriers to ward off the threat of a vehicle attack. But how secure are city streets when the weapon itself is a vehicle? Our senior home affairs correspondent Simon Israel has this report. This is the truck. No bombs, just this truck, which became the weapon to deliver mass casualties. For two kilometres, at speeds of up to 60 to 70 kilometres an hour, it was unstoppable. The carnival crowds could not be protected in one of the country's most secure cities. Every European city is now asking what more has to be done. These bollards along this viaduct in central London are designed not for aesthetic reasons but for security. They're here to prevent a vehicle being driven through or over the sides and plunging down onto the road below. There are similar structures all over this city guarding its public buildings. Using a vehicle as a weapon is not new, but repeating this everywhere people gather for a public event is nigh impossible. Last year, this ISIS publication gloated about its attacks on French soil. The nightmare in France has only just begun, it said. It promoted the idea of using a vehicle and an Al-Qaeda online magazine, Inspire, even laid out details of how to achieve maximum carnage, to strike as many people as possible in your first run. Nantes and Dijon suffered such lone wolf vehicle attacks in December 2014. 20 were injured, one died. France has been aware of this danger for some time. It was Al-Qaeda that really began to spread it to the sort of broader global jihadist uh, world in 2010 when they said 
you should really use your vehicle just to go down and mow down people, uh, to put it crudely. Islamic State capitalized on that as well, and they said uh, you should do this attack. And what's really significant is that just last month, Islamic State issued a, a communique to its supporters around the world and said, don't come here. You're behind enemy lines. Do attacks back at home. There's no evidence yet that ISIS or Al-Qaeda was behind yesterday's massacre. But in the UK today, it was announced that police forces around the country are to review security for all major events over the next seven days. We've got to make sure that we do all we can to keep uh, our citizens uh, safe. The Met Police Service and the security services, as they do regularly, uh, are reviewing measures to make sure we are safe. And, you know, uh, the thoughts and prayers of all of us are with the people of Ernest. The vehicle attack on Glasgow Airport in 2007 prompted the security review that brought in blast barriers and bollards for all transport hubs and later for many public spaces like shopping centres. But the Nice attack has shown the limitations. It is possible to use big barriers that are erected to stop vehicles, but the cost of doing that is quite prohibitive. And the time delay in getting those barriers up in advance as well, and afterwards to allow life to return to normal, is difficult. But how normal can life become? If the more barriers you put up, the more everyday anxiety and fear may result, and the more impact the terrorist has on daily lives. Well, now, the French Prime Minister has said today that terrorism is a threat that weighs heavily on France, a country under a state of emergency for the last 19 months. The Charlie Hebdo attack was the first in a series of atrocities which have left more than 200 people dead and hundreds more injured. Last night, another 84 people were killed here, not by bombs, not by guns, but by one man ploughing a hired truck through Bastille Day crowds. A night of celebration turned into a night of utter horror. Intelligence agencies are still trying to find out whether Mohamed Bukhel had any links to terror organisations. But what will be the impact on the life of France itself and on Europe's wider security? And now with me now is the French MP Christophe Premet, who, uh, Prema, who was with the crowds here in Nice as the attack happened. He was here on holiday with his uh, family. And Antoine Chauvel, who photographed the horrific aftermath. And here are some of his photographs as we speak to him. Antoine, uh, what was the, you're a war photographer. Was this war? It's, this was the worst I've ever witnessed. When I, I haven't really done the war conflicts. I've, I've, I've do action photography and uh, the smaller conflicts like south of Thailand and the favelas of Brazil. And, what was the effect upon you as a photo photographer taking these images? It was uh, shocking to say the least. It was, uh, I didn't know between the, 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 the feelings and, and what to do. Uh, it was hard for me to just take photos and, and ignore what was happening around me. It I will mean, take a long time for people to uh, forget these images or in any way put them into some kind of dreadful perspective. Yes, no, no, but yes. Thank you very much no, no. for your photographs which we've been showing while I've been speaking with you. Now, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering now, Christophe Prima, um, the challenge here is that you have an international problem uh, in Syria, Iraq, the Sahel, and you have a domestic problem. Let's deal with the international. The Prime Minister has talked of increasing action by the French in Syria. Yes, that's right. That's that's an international problem. That's the same problem actually in three different uh, countries uh, where we our armies are engaged and our armies are also our security forces are engaged in France. And uh, it is very hard for the security forces as now we have just single individuals, just like in Orlando in the USA, trying to act. Uh, but isn't there a problem about Western forces being engaged in these areas? Of course. After and, and doesn't that itself? Of almost course, make things worse at home. You have, so it has consequences that you have a, a, a strong geopolitical fracture from the, the Middle East until the Sahel. And I think it was after the, uh, the Arab Spring. And uh, we just have Tunisia, which is the only country uh, trying to survive in this, uh, in this area. So it, we pay that as we are a target right now. We know that there, there is a, a, the highest level, uh, threat, level of threat in, in, in France, but we need to to react in, in different ways, maybe trying to engage war together. But now, twice we have had attacks on France by French people. They are French. 
although they're not assimilated? Well, they, they were they were born in France, so they, they uh, yes, they, they, they have French residents, uh, of course. So that, that's uh, uh, very hard for security forces, as uh, uh, the, the killer from yesterday was not known from the from the terror uh, uh, anti-terrorist uh, organ so, uh, security organizations. So, so that's that's very uh, very hard. But you to, see, to the find. prime minister is already saying he's sure that he must be involved in some way in the circles of Islamist. Violence, although the Interior Ministry say they have no evidence yet. Yes, I thought it, it's hard because you see that you have a balance between security and freedom. And we uh, in the Parliament, so we voted different laws the last year uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, intelligence services. I think we have to be more efficient in terms of intelligence services. We have to, so in the practical way, it could be better because I think we had but the uh, anti-terror legislation. We have all the, the, the legislation, all the juridical tools right now, but we need to act more practical way with the uh, uh, how to share more information before it happens. But you can see that it's very hard because. Uh, you cannot have a, 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 a surveillance of everybody, in a, of every citizen in France, of course. And Antoine, finally, how will you position what you saw last night in what your career has been as a photographer? I mean, how, how do you place this? It's, it's hard because it's, uh, well, it's my country, you know. It happened 100 meters from my flat. My, my wife and my kid were crossing the road just before the truck came. So. It's uh, more emotional than uh, than if I was in a conflict in another country, you know. So, no, it's it's very sad and. Uh, very well, hard. thank you both very warmly for joining us. Uh, we're back tomorrow night at half past five. I can only say that this is a really terrible experience to be here. But from Fatima in London, from all of us here in Nice, that is Channel Four News. Have a very good evening and a very good weekend. Thank you.